Okay, very good. So I already showed you this slide, right? So this is about the rise of antimicrobial resistance worldwide. And then on the right-hand side, I showed you these different types of bacterial infections that are associated with AMR. Now, one of these types of infections that I'm particularly interested in at the moment is urinary tract infections. And in urinary tractions, a problem that you have with bacteria is that they have this remarkable ability to swim upstream. And here you can see a video of an experiment that was done by Norris, Norris Figueroa Morales, and she's a professor now at UC Boulder. And, and it's an amazing uh, video. This, this is what really got me interested in this, uh, in this area. You see that in this channel, all these little white bacteria are washed downstream in the center of the channel, but on the right-hand side, there is a surface. And the cells, they tend to reorient against the flow and swim upstream along these walls. And so what that means is that you think that you're rinsing out your channel, you think that you're cleaning your, uh, your device, but actually these bacteria will, will uh, you know, all reorient against this flow and then, and then contaminate regions upstream. Uh, and, um, and so we started working with with Norris, um, and uh, and uh, this this was in uh, you know 2018 2019 when she was still in Paris with Anke Lindner and Eric Clément, um, and we started to use 3D tracking uh, to follow how these bacteria can swim upstream in three dimensions, and we used Lagrange in 3D tracking for this. And the first thing that we found is that at weak flow rates, as expected, cells would swim around in circles. But if you increase the flow speed a little bit, then they would break out of these circles and then they would start swimming upstream. So that's upwards and to the right in this picture. Uh, and then above some critical flow rate, um, then the orange trajectories, they start moving downstream. Uh, and so the main objective that we had for this paper is can we calculate what flows are required to wash these cells down? Uh, so to do that, we had to come up with some kind of model. And, and what does that mean? Well, first we'll have to understand why do these cells swim upstream in the first place, right? Um, um, and uh, the main mechanism is, is kind of visualized by this picture over here. We call it a weather vane effect. What that means is that if a cell comes close to a surface, then the cell body has more friction with the wall than the flagella. So there is a differential friction between the cell body and the flagella. And so what that means is that the cell body acts like a pivot point, like an anchoring point, if you wish. And then if this flow is moving over the surface, these flagella get caught along with the flow and like a flag in the wind or like a weather vane, the flagella get turned in a downstream direction. But what that means is that the head is pointing in the upstream direction. And so then it can move up against the flow as long as it swims fast enough. Uh, another reason is that these flagella, they tend to point upwards a little bit. Um, and the flows that are further away from the surface are a little bit stronger than the flows that are closer to the surface. And so again, this leads to a reorientation against the flow direction. Uh, and, and so the simplest possible functional form of this is a reorientation that, that just looks like a restoring force, like alpha, uh, uh, the time derivative of alpha would be equal to minus the sine of alpha. Uh, but this is not the only term because bacteria experience a lot of forces and torques in flow, right? So they have some surface alignment, they like to swim around in circles, so there's a torque coming from that. Uh, there's a chirality of the flagella, and that leads to an additional torque. Uh, they tend to do Jeff Jeffrey orbits, um, and so all of these things together, if you put that into a model, you can you can make a, a you know a dynamical system, and you can find the fixed points in these uh, dynamical systems, and you find that that fixed point here corresponds to the little green arrow, which is an orientation in the upstream direction. These are the angles, uh, theta and phi, uh, associated uh, with the orientation of the bacterium. And that green star is the, uh, the fixed point angle in the, uh, pointing in the upstream direction. Uh, another thing that we discovered was remarkable, that if you go to stronger flow uh, uh, rates, 
um, then these cells begin to oscillate. So they don't just swim upstream, they, they actually have this kind of wavy oscillatory rheotaxis. Um, and so we, we measured the angle of the cells uh, by labeling their flagella fluorescently. Um, and then you can, you can basically do a Fourier transform on this and find the frequency of these oscillations. Uh, and then, and then uh, from the, uh, the theory, you can make a prediction what this frequency should be. Um, and, and, and from that, you can get a very strong confidence in what are all the different terms that come into play in this model. Um, so the main conclusion of that, or one of the conclusions was that it's important to be close to a surface. Uh, and uh, then when I started my lab here at Penn, uh, then uh, uh, the marathon runner run, runs out. He, he started doing experiments of looking at how bacteria can swim upstream in channels of different diameters. Um, and what you see here is that in the very wide channels, um, the bottom video, that's a 50 micron channel, then you see a lot of cells that are being washed downstream in the middle. There's a parabolic flow profile, and you see a lot of cells that are washed to the right. Um, but close to the surface, you know, they're kind of creeping up the walls and they, and they do tend to swim upstream. Uh, but if you go to these narrower channels, then more of the bacteria spend time close to the surface, um, and then they go more and more upstream. Uh, to the point that if you have a really narrow channel, something like five microns, basically all of them are swimming upstream. So, so when we think about urinary tract infections, then there are channels of different diameters, right? That if you go closer and closer to the kidneys, the channels get narrower and narrower. Um, and so uh, uh, what that means is that once they make their way up there, uh, yeah, it will get actually easier and easier for them. Uh, so, we, so we quantified this. Uh, and, uh, and so this is what that looks like. Um, we have the Y channels in blue then a narrow one in purple and a really narrow one in green. And what we're showing here on the horizontal axis is the flow speed, or the shear rate in inverse seconds. And on the uh, vertical axis is the average speed of the cells in the swimming direction, or in the flow direction, sorry. So, uh, so if that's positive, it means that they're swimming upstream. And so you see that as you go to narrower and narrower channels, these, these curves, they shift more and more to the right. And what that means is that they can counter stronger and stronger flows. And, and this is a logarithmic scale here, right? So the critical flow speed for the Y channels is on the order of, you know, maybe 20 or 30 or so inverse seconds. Um, but if you have a very narrow channel, you can get 100 inverse seconds. So... Uh, so yeah, they can counter much stronger flows. Uh, maybe another thing to mention, though, is that these are distributions. Uh, so so uh, and they're very very wide distributions. So the the values that we're plotting on the left are the mean of this distribution, but the standard deviation is also particularly wide. And what that means is that many of the cells will be washed downstream, but a couple of them are going upstream. Um, and in fact, you only need one to go upstream, right? So if one of them makes it uh, to the other side of the channel, it can start dividing and then it can start a new community over there. Uh, and so it's actually the, uh, the pioneers um, in these experiments that, that are uh, yeah, perhaps the most dangerous. Um, then we thought maybe we can actually prevent this upstream swimming. So we, we gave some antibiotics uh, to these bacteria. Uh, and the result was rather remarkable. We found that the cells that were treated with the antibiotics, they actually got better at moving upstream. Um, so the, the blue curve that you see here are, the, are the, the wild type cells, the untreated ones. And on average, they mostly go in the downstream direction. But the ones that were treated with the antibiotics, that's the green curve over here. Uh, and and uh, yeah, they, they have a much larger tendency to move against the flow. Uh, and so we're trying to understand this now with the holography. And we think that it's related to the shape of the cells because if you give them antibiotics, then, uh, well, this is cephalexin, which basically targets the uh, cell divisions, uh, and therefore the cells tend to grow longer. So there's probably uh, a correlation between cell length and the ability to move upstream. And so that's, uh, yeah, what we're looking at now. Um, then, uh, another thing that we looked at is what about polymers? 
because most of the research about swimming upstream was done in Newtonian fluids, you know, just uh, uh, st standard uh, water-like medium. Um, but most bacteria actually live in, in, in environments that, that have a lot of polymers, right? Biofilms or mucus. Uh, and so how does that change this ability to swim upstream? And here is a video that was taken by the lab of Yilin Wu, uh, at the uh, Chinese University of Hong Kong. Um, and uh, I mean, it's it's just stunning, isn't it? You can see that all of these cells are perfectly aligning against the flow direction. Um, and and uh, they're basically all swimming upstream. Uh, so so this, uh, you don't see any cells swimming around in circles anymore. Um, and, and so the data uh, that we took uh, looks like this, that in a Newtonian fluid, a lot of cells, you know, make kind of circling motion and they and, and they tend to go mostly downstream. But if you add some some DNA polymers, then literally all of them go upstream. Uh, and, and so if, again, if you quantify this, then for the Newtonian case, you get a line that looks like this. Uh, but for the polymer suspension, you get a line that looks like this. So so the difference of this critical flow speed is, you know, 30 times larger, like at least an order of magnitude, almost two. Um, and, and, and so now these, uh, these values, 65 inverse seconds, that's basically domestic pipe flow. So literally the pipes in your, in your home, uh, these are the kind of shear rates that you would find in these pipes. And, and um, yeah, these, these bacteria would be able to, to swim upstream against them. If there were polymers inside, uh, and so yeah, that that's just uh, yeah, absolutely stunning numbers. So so why is that? You know, <laughs> why is it that these polymers tend to enhance this upstream swimming so much? Um, well, the first thing is because of the orientation. They are much much better at aligning against the flow direction. So from these videos, you know, this is fluorescently labeling the flagella. You can exactly track their orientation. And, and those are the, the, the blue plots over here. So for the Newtonian fluid, uh, you get basically, um, yeah, like uh, uh, equal uh, likelihood of orientations in, in all the different directions. So that basically means that they swim in circles. But then if you add a little bit of polymer, then you see that this orientation distribution is very sharply peaked. Literally all of them go against the flow direction. Uh, and that's true for strong flows, uh, for, for this one over here, the bottom left. But that's also true for even very, very weak flows, like minute flows of 2.6 inverse seconds. They still very much point in the upstream direction. Uh, and so uh, orientation is one of the main drivers. So we know a little bit about the forces and the torque that are acting on these cells. Can we then come up with a model for this reorientation in polymer fluids. Uh, and this is where Alban theory comes in. Uh, and Alban um, uh, is, uh, is, is over here. She uh, did her PhD with Eric Lauga at the University of Cambridge. And she joined our lab, uh, what is it? Maybe a year or two ago. Uh, and she started doing these really nice simulations of shear thinning viscoelastic, uh, uh, sorry, shear thinning complex fluids um, and, and a, and a and a rotating object inside such a fluid close to a wall. So she's basically modeling the bacterium flagellum as it's rotating around very quickly. And what she found is that this rotation builds up some stresses. And, uh, and because of the shear thinning, then there are some areas of the fluid where the viscosity locally goes down. And there are some areas of the fluid where the viscosity locally goes up. And because of that, you get an additional torque that acts on the flagella. And this torque tends to align the cells in the direction against the flow direction. Um, and then another effect that comes into a play, uh, it, that comes into uh, play is um, viscoelasticity. And what that does is that it generates a lift force. So you have this rapidly uh, rotating flagellum in this elastic fluid, um, and that leads to hoop stresses. Uh, and, and that basically lifts up the flagellum from the surface, and that enhances this weather vane effect that we talked about. 
Uh, so it's easier for the cells to reorient against the flow direction because of these additional forces and torques. Now, if we put all of this together for different types of polymers, because you know complex fluids, there are many of them, right? You've got shear thinning fluids, shear thickening fluids, you have elastic fluids, you have rheopactic fluids. Just, there's a whole library. Uh, so you know, we 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 thought, okay, we have to try this out and, and see what's important and what's not important. Um, so we see that in DNA, in haluric acid, and then uh, uh, PAA, uh, most of the cells tend to go in the upstream direction. But then in other polymers like FICOL, which is a much shorter one, um, or, or PVP, we see that most of the cells tend to go in the downstream direction. Uh, so, so there is a, you know, there is an important difference here. But what is that difference exactly? Now, to disentangle that, um, we started doing simulations for different types of complex fluids. So we started with the Newtonian model. That's the one that we uh, developed for the paper uh, in 2019, the one with uh, with uh, with Nouris Figueroa. Uh, and, and that's this blue line over here. So on average, the cells tend to go in the downstream direction at these high flow rates. Then the first thing that we added is a speed enhancement because it's known that bacteria tend to swim a little bit faster in these complex fluids. But it turns out that that doesn't really matter. Even if they swim two times faster or even three times faster, that's not necessarily going to help you with swimming upstream. The most important thing is reorienting in the direction against the flow. And to reorient against the flow, you need two things. You need some shear thinning. That's the green line over here. So that really moves that line downwards. So, so negative numbers correspond to upstream swimming over here. And then this elastic lift force is the purple line over here. And if you add the green and the purple together, we get the, the orange line. So we get a very large uh, tendency to swim in the upstream direction. So to, to put all of those mechanisms into a diagram, this took us a long time. So we worked together with two labs. We have the lab uh, from, from Yilin, Yilin Wu, uh, and also the lab of Paolo, Paolo Aratia. And we worked together on these things at the same time. And, and you know, we were sharing each other's data and we were trying to come up with a model that would fit both the experiments from one experimental lab. And then, and then the same model also had to agree with the data from the other experimental lab, right? And and so we, we took us a long time to puzzle this out, um, but uh, but now we uh, yeah we think we have a, a pretty nice overview of what's happening here that both shear thinning and viscoelasticity are important together with the speed enhancement as well, and so together all of these things tend to enhance this upstream swimming. Uh, and uh, now the next thing that we're working on is how to understand upstream swimming in microstructured environments. So everything that we've done until now is literally just rectangular microfluidic channels, nothing interesting in terms of geometry. Uh, but now, uh, you know, in, in most natural environments and also in most uh, medical environments, you know, bacteria tend to live in, in, in spaces that have a lot of structure, right? Uh, and, uh, and the most important thing is that they could be sitting in some kind of wet reservoir, say here on the left-hand side, there's a lot of bacteria, and then they need to break out of that reservoir against the flow direction, then propagate upstream in a narrow channel, and then again, infiltrate a new reservoir, uh, and, and then uh, the, the flows will be weaker in that new reservoir, and then they can settle down, and then they can start dividing again, build up that population, and then go onwards like that. So the first thing that we did is to just look at a lot of trajectories of these three steps. So, so what's the probability of breaking out of these reservoirs against the flow? Um, and then what's the probability of reaching the other end of the channel? And then finally, what's the probability uh, of actually invading into a new uh, uh, reservoir? <laughs> and Rand, he, he likes to make a joke about this and he, he thinks this is like a bit like the PhD pipeline. Uh, so, you know, first you need to get into grad school, then you need to work for a long time and write a lot of papers. And then finally, you need to actually write a thesis. <laughs> and, and the question is, which of these three steps is the bottleneck, right? Um, so so what, uh, what is hardest? 
Uh, and so for these bacteria, it turns out that step one uh, is probably the bottleneck. Um, so, so it's very, very difficult to break out of a reservoir and go into a thin channel. And then once you're in the thin channel, it's actually relatively easy to propagate uh, and, to, and to invade the new reservoir. Uh, so, so yeah, when you, uh, when you combine these things, you need to have some kind of stochastic model that will link the fluxes from these three steps together. Uh, and once you know that for a single um, um, uh, uh, connector, then you can start doing this for a series of invasions, right? So, so we call this a serial invasion project, uh, where all the bacteria they start here at the bottom of this of this large reservoir, and then they all start invading into these little micro chambers, invading one city after the next, um, and then and then uh, eventually they they can. You know, reach um, the, uh, the areas upstream. So this could be like an organ. This could be like um, uh, invading areas inside the kidneys further and further, for example. Uh, and then, so we've looked at this individual trajectories of bacteria and these in these invasion problems, and also biofilm formation after a longer time. Uh, and then, uh, you know, after looking at channels that are connected in series. Of course, you start looking at channels that are connected in parallel as well. So, so here is a branching uh, microchannel with flows coming from different uh, directions. And then you can look at the probability of, you know, how many cells go to the left, how many cells go to the right. And you can also prevent the motion of cells moving against the flow in structured uh, wavy microchannels. So, so, you know, once you have this, and then I'm speeding up a little bit because of time, uh, you can look at bacteria and networks. Uh, so here is a flow network um, that has uh, an inlet on the top left corner and an outlet on the top right corner. Uh, and, and we made a combination of these straight and wavy channels. Uh, and what we can do is we can actually control the accumulation of bacteria in specific areas by changing the, the, the geometry of these channels. So here uh, we, we have a very strong accumulation of cells in the, in the bottom left reservoir, and we have a rarefication in the top right one. Uh, and, and so by changing the flow rate and by changing uh, the, the pressure of the inlets and the outlets in these channels, uh, you, can, you can control in real time, you know, you can, you can uh, control the, the spatiotemporal density of these bacteria and these networks. And that's cool because then you can do this not just for one bacteria, but you can actually do this for multiple species as well. Um, so here we have a similar network now with E. coli and Pseudomonas. Um, and the E. coli cells are actually a little bit slower. They swim on average about 20 microns per second. And I think that the Pseudomonas ones were faster in this experiment. But the problem is that E. coli, uh, that, that Pseudomonas is not so good at swimming upstream. They're faster, but they're not so good at swimming upstream. Uh, and, and so you can actually separate bacterial communities in this way, uh, that, that some species, um, they, they are able to, to go up against the flow, um, and, uh, and the green ones are not. Uh, and, and so you can not just control the density of one species in space and time, but you can actually control the density of multiple species in space and time. And, and of course, this totally affects their ecology, right? Um, and so by changing the flow rates and by changing the, 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 the geometry, um, that, that will then control um, the habitats or the, the niches that these, uh, that these cells will, will uh, form. Uh, I think that's mostly it from my side. Uh, I had one more idea that I wanted to share with you. We also work a little bit on soft robotics. And, and here is a drug delivery project that we worked on. And, and so basically the idea is that we can transport my, uh, micro particles along these very thin filaments. And, and you know, we're interested uh, uh, in, in drug delivery because these are magnetic particles that can be used for cancer therapy. Um, but besides cancer therapy, we, we also want to use this as antimicrobial surfaces. So, I mean, there are a lot of antimicrobial surfaces that use like super hydrophobicity and microstructures that kind of prevent the adhesion of bacteria. But I think eventually they all fail. Um, and so instead of uh, preventing the cells to, to stick in the first place, 
we actually want to rip them off actively. So we want an actively self-cleaning surface that will that will pull the bacteria off uh, using these magnetic forces that you can use to drive these systems. And so that's what our student uh, Ernest is working on right now, Ernest Park. So, so he made the same thing in two dimensions. So he made a two-dimensional active surface that consists of these small micromagnetic uh, arrays. Um, and, uh, and then if you apply a magnetic field, you can see that particles uh, yeah, are transported and, and, uh, and very rapidly uh, yeah, pulled off from this uh, surface. Um, and so, uh, yeah, this will be um, another interesting thing to, uh, to work on in the coming years. So combining the work of nanotechnology and, and bacteria microbiology at the same time. So I think I've probably overstayed my welcome. Uh, and so I will say thanks <laughs> to, <laughs> you know, to all my lab members, uh, funding agencies, and, and, and uh, you know, wonderful, wonderful collaborators that I've had the pleasure to work with in the last years. Uh, so with that, I'll say thank you. Here's an overview of the things that we work on. Um, and please let me know if you have any questions. Thanks very much.